Amen. Praise God. Yes. If you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn to the book of Galatians uh, this morning, chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. I've got to switch something up here for a minute, so give me just a minute here. Oh, we've got to dismiss the kids, yeah, to children's church, children's worship, so... Anybody, uh, kindergarten through uh, fourth grade is uh, welcome to be dismissed uh, this morning to that. John, I'm not talking about your you know, actions, I'm talking about your age, okay? So you can't go. You got to stay. You got to stay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10 today. And a couple weeks ago, we began a series entitled The Harvest. The Harvest. And in this series, we're going to be looking at different aspects and different examples of harvesting in the Bible. And basically, you know, it goes right along with where we're at right now with the harvest happening this fall, uh, with the crops and everything coming out. And, and so there's a lot that's talked about farming and harvesting in the Bible. And so that's what we're looking at. We began with the words of Jesus telling his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So that's where we started out. The harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. So we discovered that to see a great harvest of souls, that's what Jesus was talking about. We have to see what Jesus saw and feel what Jesus felt, do what Jesus did, and pray what Jesus prayed. To send laborers out into the harvest. But not just, Lord, send them, Lord, send me. Uh, never pray, Lord, send them until you pray, Lord, send me. Yes. And so we looked at that first of all, the compassion Jesus had for lost souls. And then last week, uh, we once again looked at the words of Jesus, and we looked at a parable. And Jesus used this parable. A parable is a, an, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, kind of in its simplest form. But Jesus used the parable of growing wheat in a field and the tares that grew within it. And then he paralleled it together to this world that we live in here now, but also to the eventual spiritual harvest at the end of time. And so we saw that, that Jesus used this parable about uh, the, uh, the wheat and the tares. Now today, we're going to be looking at something a little bit different. Something that people would refer to, we would refer to in this world, kind of a worldly thing, as an unchangeable and absolute law. An unchangeable and absolute law. Now, we know there's God's law, but this is more the laws of nature that still are underneath God's law. Uh, and, and so we're going to be looking at unchangeable and absolute law. But what we're going to see is it's kind of like the law of, and I would, I'm not going to elaborate on this, uh, uh, the laws of physics. I don't know enough about that to, to, to elaborate on that, but I know they're there. The laws of, of even mathematics, let's get a little simpler. I know that two times two is four. And, and I know Common Core would probably go around that to get to the answer, but I still know that's the, that's the truth. It's, 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 it's in, inevitable, immutable that it's going to come up with that. Now, the laws of science and nature also play into this, the laws of science and nature. So there's certain things that are just absolutes within the laws of science and nature, the law of gravity, the law of gender. In fact, there's a lot of craziness out there about the law of, of gender right now. Uh, I, I would have to say that uh, in Genesis, uh, when God created male and female, that that's the way it still is today. And, and that anything outside of that, you can change it, uh, lie about it, mutate it, whatever you want to, but it's still God creates male and female. That's, that's the law of nature. That's the law of gender. And, and so that's, that's what we see. They're absolutes. These laws are immutable, inevitable, and they're absolute. So today, we're going to be examining a law that is really no different, but we see it in the Bible. And we know all these encompassed in the Bible. Everything is from God. All of the universe, all of, all of these laws of nature even come from God. But some of these have spiritual implications, and some of these have physical, moral, and spiritual implications of absolutes. And, and this law that we are going to look at today in Galatians is the law of the harvest, the law of the harvest. Anybody ever heard of the law of the harvest? Uh, this is where it comes from in Galatians chapter 6. And it does contain physical, moral, and spiritual absolutes and truth. You can't change it. And, and, and when you hear it, 
You're going to say, how, how basic and simple? You know, you're going to say, duh, preacher. Everybody knows that. But we don't live by it. We don't, we don't believe in it. We don't, we don't act like it. it, it this, this law is inevitable. It's an absolute. It's kind of like gravity. You know, I can, I can ignore the law of gravity. Did you know that? I, I, can, I can refute it. I can, I can try and avoid it. I can deny it. But I guarantee you, if you jump off a cliff, you're going to find out that gravity, the law of gravity, is going to take effect, right? It's going to happen. I could say, I don't believe if I jump off this cliff that anything's going to happen. I don't believe in the, in the law of gravity. Well, you're going to find out different when you jump off a cliff that the law of gravity is going to take hold. Whether you believe it or not, think it or not, live it or not, act on it or not, that's what's going to happen. And that's what I want us to see within this law today, the law of the harvest, because so many people ignore it, think somehow they can avoid it, and the, the sooner that we accept it and apply it and live it within our lives, the better off we will be. Our, our, our own lives, our families, our futures, when we just live by this law, and, and, and Paul's writing a letter to the Galatian church here, and he's telling them many spiritual truths, but he uses you know, this, this farming type of law that, that, that we're going to see here today that applies to spiritual truth. So the law of the harvest. Let's all stand. I'm going to read this to you today. And then we're going to expound upon it. In Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 7, Paul says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows of the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and, and we thank you, God, for all that's happened so far here in this time of worship for the baptism, the celebration of new life, and Lord, for just the words that we sang to you, I pray that they were on our lips and on our hearts and minds to, of praise and worship to you, Lord. Father, I pray that as we now have read your word, and, and your word is truth, and your word is life, and they, they contain absolutes, Lord, that, that you have put into place, God, that, that we cannot avoid, and we are better off to live by them, Lord. Help us, God, to see this, this law today and, and apply it to our lives, Lord. Father, I pray that we could glean from this. I pray that we could see within this, Lord, uh, the truths that it holds. Father, now as I expound upon your word, I pray that it's, it's the words that you want me to speak, God, and that I would just be the vessel that you would use, Lord, to speak words to, to our hearts and our minds today, Lord. Uh, convict us, convince us, change us, God, uh, by your word. It's in Jesus' powerful and precious name that I pray this all. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning, as I said, I know you're on the edge of your seat wondering what this law is now. You just can't, how many of you just can't wait to hear what this is? Any, anybody? Okay, yeah, we got some hands going up. What is the law of the harvest? Frank raised it about 20 seconds later. He's a little slow, but he got his hand up there, okay? So, so the law of the harvest, what is it? Are, are you ready for it? Are, are you ready? Now listen to this. It's going to blow your mind away. Listen to what, listen to what the law of the harvest is. Uh, listen, it's found in verse 7. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. You got your money's worth today, Frank, didn't you? For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And, and here again, you go, well, duh, preacher. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's, it's obvious that that's right. But this has so many spiritual and moral and physical implications, and so many people miss it. It's obvious in, in the Word of God. This doesn't just apply to a farming practice. This applies to all of us in every area of our life. It, it's universal. Now think about this. In business, whatever you sow, that you will reap. In government, oh boy, whatever you sow, that you will reap. In marriage, whatever you sow, that you will reap. In our family life, in our Christian life. Whatever you sow, that you will reap. And even in the church, whatever you sow, 
that you will also reap. And if we don't live by it, we will fall victim to it. Just like the law of gravity. If I don't, if I don't apply that, if I don't listen to that, if I don't live by that, uh, I'm going to get hurt. And, and, and so the law of the harvest is the same. Why don't people live by it? It's because they ignore the absolutes. What are the absolutes? There's three absolutes, and there's probably more than that, but I want to give you three absolutes that are contained within the law of the harvest that God just like, there they are. You know, here's the law. Remember, whatever man sows, that he shall also reap. Duh, preacher, that's what it is. But I want to grab three absolutes from within that that Paul expounds upon here. And the first one has to do with deception. Now listen, I don't care who you are. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how popular you are. I don't care how much you've got. I don't care who you think you are. Deception will never work. Deception will never work within the law of the harvest. You will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. That's a fact. We, we, but, but somehow, deception creeps in. Somehow, we think that, that we can get by. Somehow, we get a free pass. Somehow, somehow that, 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 you know, it's just it, not me. It, it, that would never happen to me. And, and somehow, this deception doesn't apply to me. Deception will never work. First of all, we try to deceive others. How do we try to deceive others? Well, we do things and we think, here, have you ever thought this? They'll never know. They'll never know. Sometimes, and we're going to get to that, brother. Sometimes we think, well, if I do this, even if it's wrong and I hide it, no one will ever get hurt. We deceive others. We apply this to our families. If my family doesn't know, it's not going to hurt anything. If my job, if, if my boss doesn't know, it's not going to hurt anything. If, if my friends don't know, if my church doesn't know, it'll be fine. So we try to deceive others. Deception. And, and then sometimes, you know the, the easiest person to deceive sometimes? Is yourself. We talk ourselves into, have you ever talked yourself into things and you just thought, boy, that was stupid. What was I thinking? And, and we deceive ourselves. Somehow this doesn't apply to me. Sometime, somehow I'll be okay. Somehow I'm going to beat the system. What I reap, I'm not going to sow. But what we see from Scripture is, now listen, you can fool some of the people some of the time and all of the people all of the time, but listen to me. You will never fool God. You hear me? You will never, ever deceive God. You see, you can't fool the Lord. In verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. You know what we do? We take and, and we're out in the world and we're doing our thing and all of a sudden there's things that we do and places that we go and, and all of a sudden we think, you know what, it's buried beneath the soil and no one will ever know. And, and, and we bury it deep within and, and sometimes it's buried deep within our hearts and deep within our minds and, and deep within our lives and, and, and nobody around knows you can bury it as deep as you want to and, and there may be something right now that you think you're getting by with, God cannot be fooled. He cannot be mocked. There's been times in my life, I'll admit to you, somehow I thought in my mind that it's going to be okay because nobody knew, and, and I don't want you to think horrible things, but just some things that, like, okay, nobody knows it's going to be okay. God knew, and sometimes God called me out on it, and, and, and I, can't, I can't fool God. I can't deceive God. That's what Paul says here. You can bury it, you can cover it up, you can put it beneath the soil as deep as you want to, but God still knows. Anything in your life that you think is not known to the world, maybe you can hide from, but God knows exactly what's in your life. So, deception will never work. Because ultimately, let me ask you folks, ultimately, who do you answer to? And don't tell me your wife. You may right now, but someday, someday, you will answer to God. 
You, you may get by with things, or you may have to answer to people here on this, in this earth and, 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 uh, of things, and, and you may be accountable, but someday you will stand before God. And you can bury things, and you can cover it up and think that no one will ever know. It won't hurt anybody. It's, and some of you are thinking of some things right now maybe God's starting to prick your hearts with, and, and, and you deceive yourself. How about this, Christian? A lot of times, for some reason, Christians get to the point in their life that they think that, that everything is perfect. And, and, and they actually, they know it's not, but they bury things deep down inside because I got to put on the perception, especially as a pastor, I got to be perfect. I can't mess up. I can't have things wrong, and I deceive myself. And, and so all of a sudden, I put those things in there. Guess what? Whatever I sow... Someday that's what I will reap. The law of the harvest. In fact, we convince ourselves somehow that we don't need to confess sin before God. As Christians, let me tell you something. You're covered by the blood of Jesus, amen? But you still need to be confessing sin every day. It doesn't take away your salvation, but boy, does it take away your joy it doesn't take away from your relationship with God. It drives a wedge in there because the sin that we bury deep within us and we do not let God forgive us and repent. In 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5, just let me read this for you because it goes right along. This is the message which we are, have heard from him, from God, declaring to you that God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. Who are we lying to? We're lying to ourselves, and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is, is in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sins. Now listen to this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But listen to this. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, God, out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Folk, I believe too many times as Christians, we bury that stuff within us and we never confess it to God and we stand, and we, we stand condemned before God because of what we're doing, not to, to, to utter, utter destruction, but of the relationship that God wants with us because we do not confess sin. God is writing this to Christians. God is, this has been written, this word John wrote was written to Christians. Deception will never work. Next thing has to do with decisions. Do you know that every decision has some kind of consequence? Did you know that? Every decision has some kind of a consequence. Your decision to come to church today has some kind of consequence. Your decisions not to come to church can have some kind of consequence. Every decision we make have consequences. Now, we think of consequences as negative. Consequences can be positive, too. But when I think of the negative consequences from the silly things that, that... Have you ever said this? Have you ever even taken joy in saying, what did you expect? Have you ever had your child do something and you look at them and you say, what did you think was going to happen? What did you expect the outcome to be out of this? You, you may have said that to your child. You may have said that to a friend. You may even had to say, say that to a brother. And had to call him out and say, what did you expect was going to happen? Now, here's the philosophy. Remember, whatever, you, whatever man sows, that he will also reap. So let me just put it this way. How many of you would sow turnips and expect to get tomatoes out of that? No! How many of you, and, and I, I brought this up, and Becky, I had to grab some sunflower seeds out of the, and I know these have been roasted and all, so don't get too technical on me, but, but sunflower seeds. If I planted these sunflower seeds in this dirt, what would I expect? Nothing? I'd expect sunflowers, right? I, I'd, I'd expect that. I wouldn't expect to get daffodils or dandelions or tomatoes or turnips, I'd expect sunflowers to be produced from that. Yet the law of the harvest we ignore. We think somehow the decisions that we make are not going to have the consequences that we want in the outcome. 
Let me ask you this to put it into more. I'm not just talking about seeds here. I'm talking about our lives. I'm talking about physically, morally, spiritually, the decisions that we make. Let me ask you this. If you sow discord, should you expect unity? If you sow anger and bitterness, would you expect joy and peace to come from that? If you sow negativity, how do you expect something positive to happen? And if you sow lies, how do you expect the truth to ever emerge? You see, so many times, somehow we think, well, you know what? I'm just, I'm mad at that person. You ever get mad at somebody? Okay, three honest people in here. We get mad. So you're mad at somebody right now, I'll bet you. And if I go long enough, you're going to be mad at me too, aren't you? Amen. Amen, that's right. But Merle, if you sow anger, bitterness... If you get mad, it's going to come back to get you. We have to be very careful. Now, some people can hurt us. Some people can harm us. Some people, things just, you just don't like them. But the more anger and bitterness, it robs from us. Because I'm planting those seeds in my life. And, and, and forgiveness. It, let me ask you this. How many of you believe that, you know, you got to forgive people if you want God's forgiveness? And, and if I can't forgive somebody and I'm sowing seeds of unforgiveness and planting them in my life, how can I expect to, to, for forgiveness to be produced in my life? What did you expect? And, and if I go around talking about people and, and sowing discord and trying to divide people, as it seems like the government is so good at doing, how can they ever expect, how can we ever expect unity? It's not going to happen. You don't sow turnips and expect tomatoes. Now, in verse 8, he's talking about of the flesh and of the spirit. Look what it says. It says, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. And, and, and some translations say, for he who, who sows to please his flesh, which that fits very well, is, is going to reap corruption. And, and he who sows to please the spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And, and, and you've got to be careful about how much you read into that, but I can tell you this. You know the flesh that we live in right here, right now, the flesh, the body we live in, the, the natural body that we have, do you know our flesh is fallen? When the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we live in a fallen world. Since Adam and Eve, when they chose to disobey God. How many of you have ever disobeyed God? Every hand in this place got to go up. We've all disobeyed God. We're all on the same field here. We've all disobeyed God. We've broken his laws. We've done things that are wrong. We have messed up. All have sinned. We've fallen. In the flesh, we cannot, we cannot do good. In the spirit, we're not fallen. Listen to me, folks. We're forgiven. In the flesh, it is temporal, and the thing sown to the Spirit is eternal. In the flesh, we sow corruption, and in the Spirit, we are cleansed. You see, when it comes to the Lord, the things that we sow of the flesh are temporary, fallen, and corrupt. Now, I can tell you this. I won't say the person's name. I've used this illustration before, but I had someone that, that I worked hard to lead to the Lord many years ago. And one of the biggest things was, real good guy. I mean, you know, he very rough around the edges and, and all this, but, but he, one of his big things was he liked to help other people. And he had a, how do I say this? He had a group of others he was around that would help other people. And, and when I was witnessing to him and talking about Jesus and had many, many conversations about his need for the Lord in his life, one of the things that I said to him that almost broke the deal that he could not deal with was this. I said, you know what? All those things that you do are really not, they, they may be good things, but they're not of God. Now, now listen to me. If I'm sowing seeds in the flesh as a lost person, I can do good things, but I cannot do God things. You understand? If I, can, I can do good things, but they don't count in God's kingdom because if I'm lost, I'm not going to be in God's kingdom anyway. I'm, I'm lost and, and destined for hell. And so here's what I'm trying to get at. 
So many people in this world, including so-called Christians, they believe that if they sow enough good deeds in the, in the, in the flesh, somehow they're going to get to heaven. And that's Satan's lie. You cannot do enough good deeds in the flesh because the flesh is corrupt. Now, there's good things that happen. But the seeds that we sow that are of the flesh are of the flesh. They're temporal. They're fallen. They're corrupt. But when we sow the seeds of the Spirit, and I told this guy, you're doing good things, but until you're saved, you're not doing God things. He got mad. And he did a lot of good things, but he had to understand until you give your life to Jesus, all you can sow is the seeds of the flesh. But when you sow the seeds of everlasting life from the, the perspective of that and in the spirit, those things last forever. So do I want to sow seeds? Now, now as Christians, we still have choices. I need, to, I need to say that too. As Christians, we still live in the, in the flesh, Amen. And you know what happens? I told somebody this morning when I was talking with them, even though you're saved, you still got the flesh to deal with every day. You still have to crucify the flesh every day because, because I still live in this fleshly body. I still have to make choices of whether am I going to obey the flesh or am I going to obey the Spirit of God. And those two natures are fighting against each other. How many of you battle as a Christian trying to do the good thing, the right thing, godly thing every day? Then, then that's good. Why? If that tension's not there, then you say, why is it not? But you have to, we have to realize that those things of the flesh, the, the un, unsaved people can only sow to the flesh. But Christians can have a choice to sow to things to eternal life. So, so let me ask you this. When you're sowing seeds, when you're planting seeds in your life, doing good, trying to do the right thing, trying to do godly things, do you want to do that so that you can enjoy that only here and now? Or do you want to do that in the spirit so that you can, you can enjoy the rewards the rest of your life? That's the difference. If, if I do something, I can do a good thing as a Christian, and I can do it with the wrong motive, with the wrong attitude, for the wrong reason, for my own benefit. And if I do that, that's still sowing seeds of corruption, and it will not last. So I have to be very careful that when I'm doing things, I'm doing them for the right reason and for God's kingdom and for everlasting life so that when I sow those seeds, they will not only produce now, they will produce forevermore. You see, we have choices, decisions, the law of the harvest. Decisions will always have consequences. The last thing I want you to hear today. Three absolutes contained within the law of the harvest. Number one, deception will never work. Number two, decisions will have consequences, good or bad. And due season will always come. Due season will always come. Let me just ask you, let's take a straw poll here right now. Have you faced some things in your life recently that you just ask, is it really worth it? Is, is, is it really worth it? And when you're trying to live the Christian life and you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to live for the Lord and it seems like everything is not going your way. I have a lot of those days. When you look around at this world out in the fields and you look at everyone else and it seems like everyone else is better off than I am. You ever thought that? How about this? Everyone is more blessed than I am. Everyone has more good than I have. Not only other believers, but even lost people. It seems like they, they have it better than I do. I can tell you this, and I want to encourage you with verse 9. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says this, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For what? In due season, in due time... We shall reap, not we may reap or we could reap, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. What's Paul trying to do? He's trying to encourage the Christian church of Galatia. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to encourage you right now. Someday, even though it seems like everything is going against you, someday it seems like, even though it seems like the, 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 this world is just so hard to live in, someday, even though it seems like everything you try to do right goes wrong, someday the seeds that you're sowing will come to life. There will be purpose, there will be reason, 
There will be rewards and there will be rejoicing. You know, I believe it was the evangelist Billy Sunday that preached the famous message, Payday Someday. What a good title, Payday Someday. You know what basically that message would be saying? You will reap what you sow. Sometimes we reap immediate rewards from what we do. I do something and I see the fruit of that and it's so good and, and God is blessing that. And then there's other times that it seems like, man, it's just so long and so hard. And, and finally, maybe down the road, we see something happen. And then there's times where it's like, I just never see how this was worthwhile. I don't, I don't know how and why. And, and I'm trying to figure it out and I'm trying to get through. And, and, and just remember, there will be a payday someday. The law of the harvest says you will reap what you sow. Right now you may be sowing seeds of righteousness. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, and, and I'm not going to go there because in Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to preach a series on that sometime, the fruit of the Spirit. It talks of sowing negative and producing negative, and it talks of all the fruits that can produce positive. And, and as we do that, sometimes we think that, well, I'm not seeing the fruit in my life that I want to see. Well, believe me that the fruits are stored up in heaven as well. Do not lose heart. You may be doing something right now and you think no one knows what I'm doing. Guess what? God does. That could be good or bad. If you're sowing seeds of righteousness, you continue to do that. God knows what you're doing, even if no one else does. If you're sowing seeds that you think you can hide and deceive from the Lord, God knows what you're doing. God knows your intention. Too many times I think, and I have to be careful as a preacher, a pastor, I have to be careful that I'm not doing it for the I'm doing the right thing for the wrong reason. And that can happen. We can be teaching a, a Sunday school journey class, but it's really more about me or about how, what I can have fulfilling than it, than it is about God. We can be doing a ministry in the church. We can be doing things for the Lord out in the public, and it's more about the recognition that I get and not what God can receive out of this. I think on that payday someday when due season comes, there are going to be people that think all these rewards are coming, but God says, you received your fruit here on this earth, and now it's gone. Your attitude. How many of you ever have a problem with attitude? About five honest people in here. <laughs> right now, you need to change your attitude because you probably have one. Our attitude. God knows your attitude when you do something. Well, I guess if nobody else will do this, I'll just do it. You ever do that? God knows your attitude. He knows every single seed that you plant that is good seed and Christ-like seed and due season will come. You know, I don't know about you, but I like rewards here on this earth, but I'd much rather have my rewards in heaven where they'll last forever. And so if we got to work hard and toil hard and sow the seeds, guess what? Someday, someday... Even maybe not even here, you will reap what you've sown. So what do we do about that? Diane, you want to come on up? Is she here? She, oh, she's back there. Okay. So what do we do about that? Therefore, in light of this law that we've just read and these absolutes, what should we do? How about this? What should we do? Well, look at verse 10. Paul says, therefore, because of all these things that I've just told you, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. What does Paul tell us to do? Use every opportunity that you have. How, how many of you really believe and you know that you've lost opportunity to do the right thing and it's passed you by? You can't get that back, but boy, you can get the next one. Use every opportunity that you have to do good to do God, not just to the people that you like, not just to the people who will reward you, not just for the fruit here and now, but to all people, even the ones you don't like. Boy, that's hard. Right now, can you imagine doing good for someone that you really don't like? That's what he's saying here, even, even to all, and especially to each other. Do you know, do you know this, that I'll just be honest, I, I've been hurt in my life more by people at times in the church than outside the church. 
It happens. And, and maybe not intentionally or maybe not knowingly or, or maybe so, but, but it, it hurts. And, and we have to be mindful of everyone in the household of God. There, there's times that we have to understand that we need to be sowing seeds of love towards one another and not, you know what, I, I, I just, I don't even want to talk to that person. Or, or, or you know what, I just, I, I, I can't say one good thing about that person. Well, if you can't even do that, don't say anything at all. That's what they say, right? Or maybe it's just that you've got some anger or bitterness bottled up inside you and, and, and you don't know why you can't find your joy and your peace. Maybe it's more about, you haven't realized it, but hey, here's what you do. The person that's close to you, ask them, you know, have I been more negative or more positive lately? And let them be honest. I, I've seen brothers and sisters in Christ that it seems like the, the, the anger and bitterness is more prevalent than the, than the, than the good and, and the joy. If, if you belong to the house of God, if you belong to Jesus, say amen. Take every opportunity to do good, to sow the good seeds. You can't fool, you may fool the preacher, you may fool people around, you can't fool God. Make every decision, one decision at a time, choice to do the right thing because there are, there are consequences for that. And I, I want good consequences and I don't want people to say, what did you expect? I want people to say, that guy's living for Jesus. Everything he says, everything he does. And then finally, I just want to encourage you. If you're going through a, a rough season in your Christian walk and you just feel like, I just, I just don't know if I can go on, just, just know this, that due season will come. Someday Jesus is coming back, amen? And when he does, everything that's wrong will be made right. Everything that went unrewarded, the hard work that you've done will be rewarded. God doesn't miss a thing. He doesn't miss one single seed that you sow for his kingdom, ever. Maybe it's your attitude. Maybe it's your, your intentions. Maybe you just need to give it to God today and say, you know what? I'm a smart enough person to know whatever I sow, I'm going to reap. I can't fool anybody. I definitely can't fool God. There's something there that I have to get rid of. There's something there that that's holding me back. There's unforgiveness. There's anger. There's bitterness. There's whatever it may be. Quit sowing those seeds and, and get, get it right with God. People here today who don't know Jesus, and I'm sure there's some here and, and, and are watching and listening, you can do all the good things in the world and you're never going to sow a seed of righteousness for God's kingdom. And I know you may get mad about that and be upset about, well, what about all these things that I do and I give money and I put my time... Those are all good things, but are they for God's kingdom? You, you can't sow spiritual seeds if, if you're not a born-again believer. You have to be sure that, that you do know Jesus. And the great thing about that is, no matter where you're on your life, and no matter what you've done, and no matter what's happened in your life, if you turn and repent, all the seeds, all the ugly seeds that you think in your life, He can take those away and give you a fresh new slate. A, a patch of soil that you can plant the good seeds on, the godly seeds, and grow for his kingdom, and, and it'll be gone forevermore. What do you do? You repent. You quit trying to deceive everyone and say, I, I need Jesus, and you, you receive him as your Savior. Remember, whatever, whatever you sow, that you will reap. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord God, that you would just the seeds that were sown today of, of your word, that they would be planted in hearts of fertile soil and they would grow and they would, they would just convict us, encourage us, whatever it needs to do today, God, in our lives. Help us, God, as we try to serve you and, and to be sowing those seeds of, of righteousness and forgiveness and love and, and of Jesus, the fruits of the Spirit being produced. Father, for the one who doesn't know you today, I pray that they would just turn and repent and give their life to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.